Hello and welcome to Tech on Tech, the only show that brings you to the future. The future is here and we are in it. So you better brace up because we are right about to take off. My name is Stephanie Ayata and the hashtag is Tech on Tech. As you know, it's always a pleasure having you around. And I'm especially excited about today's show. But before we get into things, I'd like us to engage in a conversation. How do you feel about the authorities or the information sharing sites accessing your data and private information without your consent? Are you the person who'd be like, I don't care because you don't have anything to hide? Or are you the person who's like, I know my rights? So talk to us, we'd like your feedback, and the hashtag is Take on tech. As you do that, let us move to the tech news where we update you on what's happening in the tech world. Mombasa has been ranked as the place with the fastest internet speed in Kenya. This is according to a survey by Global Network Testing and Data Analytics from Ookla through its speed test tool. The study was conducted in April, May and June. Mombasa is said to lead in mobile upload speeds at 17.13 Mbps, followed by Nairobi at 13.27 Mbps, Nakuru at 12.65 Mbps, Eldoret at 10.11 Mbps, and Kisumu at 8.95 Mbps. In terms of latency, which is the delay in the transfer of data, Kisumu registers the highest delay among major towns at 49 milliseconds, followed by Eldoret at 41 milliseconds, Nakuru and Nairobi tie at 37 milliseconds, Mombasa then follows at 35 milliseconds. Safaricom has been ranked as the fastest mobile internet provider at 27.54 Mbps, followed by Airtel at 17.48 Mbps, Fiber lies at 14.38 Mbps, then Telcom follows at 8.17 Mbps. Fiber tops at the average latency for top mobile providers in the country at 27 milliseconds, followed by Telcom at 33 milliseconds. Safaricom comes third at 37 milliseconds, followed by Airtel at 38 milliseconds. The research found that for mobile internet users, the average download speed in Kenya is 22.37 Mbps, while the upload speed is 13.27 Mbps. Which with a latency of 37 milliseconds. For home or fixed internet users, the average speed is 23.51 Mbps when downloading content, 20.16 Mbps when uploading, with a delay of 33 milliseconds, signaling a better internet experience than mobile users. These speeds are optimal for a third world country. However, Kenya is still way below Ookla's global average download speed of 55.34 Mbps for mobile users and 106.6 one Mbps for fixed internet consumers. A crowdfunded legal case in the United Kingdom attempting to stop the rollout of 5G has been blocked by a judge. The group behind it, which has raised more than £160,000, has said it will continue its battle to try to obtain a judicial review. The case raises questions about the nature of crowdfunded legal action as well as the debate over 5G, which mainstream scientists believe possess no greater risk to health than other wireless technologies. It argues the government is failing to protect citizens from the health risk from 5G networks, which it says will add to existing harmful radiation from mobile phones, Wi-Fi networks, and smart devices. The government's defense in this case cited advice from the World Health Organization and Public Health England that 5G is safe. In her judgment, Mrs. Justice Forster wrote that the defendants have set out their rational, scientifically-based view that there is nothing fundamentally different about the physical characteristics of the radio signals produced by 5G compared to those produced by 3G and 4G. 5G operates in a radically different way to previous upgrades to mobile infrastructure. Early improvements have generally allowed for faster data transfers, in turn supporting the development of innovative consumer-facing technology. 5G will help improve consumer experience through faster speeds and lower latency. Proponents argue that it will have a much broader impact on society because of how the technology is configured. The new book about the Tesla CEO, who is running by far the most valuable company in the world, suggests that Elon Musk 
asked Tim Cook to make him CEO of Apple. The Tesla CEO has come out to say that he doesn't want to be CEO of anything. Musk doesn't have a press office and only communicates on Twitter. He says that the company doesn't need one. He took to his full Twitter mode to say that he has never asked to be CEO of Apple. Five years ago, in the midst of manufacturing delays and other issues plaguing Tesla's planned Model 3 launch, Musk is said to have had a phone call with Tim Cook during which the Apple CEO proposed buying Tesla. Musk said he'd do it but on one condition that he's met the CEO. It reportedly took Cook a moment to realize Musk meant taking his job. And according to the Los Angeles Times review of PowerPlay, Cook reportedly responded to Musk with an expletive and hung up the phone. Tesla is by far the most expensive car company in the world and yet it is striking that running that company isn't enough for Musk, who is also the second richest person on the planet. Musk is the boss of SpaceX, which was awarded a contract by NASA to put people onto the moon. He also founded the Boring Company in 2016, which aims to revolutionize travel through advances in tunneling technology. Apart from Mombasa being a tourist destination site because of the beaches and the hotels, it now has an added bonus of high internet connectivity speeds. How cool is that? Now to the tech of the week, we feature the COVID-19 data tracking apps that have been used around the world and the debate it has sparked on the data privacy. Here is Tech of the Week. Since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, many countries have rushed to build contact tracing apps to prevent the spread of the virus. An example of this is the Australia's COVID Safe app. It is designed to anonymously register nearby contacts. If a contact later identifies as infected with COVID-19, health department officials can rapidly follow up with their registered contacts to stop the virus spread. Stay State and territory health officials can only access app information if someone tests positive and agrees to the information in their phone being uploaded. These health officials can only use the app information to help alert those who may need to quarantine or get tested. One registers to use the app by entering a name, which can also be a pseudonym, age range, mobile number, and postcode. Then they will receive a confirmation text message to complete the installation. Based on this information, COVIDSAFE generates an encrypted reference code for the app on that phone. It uses Bluetooth to look for other devices that have the app installed. It takes a note of a contact when it occurs through a digital handshake. It securely logs the other user's encrypted reference code and the time, date, Bluetooth signal strength, and proximity of the contact on the user's phone and notes the phone model. This information is then securely encrypted and stored on the phone. COVIDSAFE does not record one's location. It stores contact on the phone for 21 days. This allows for the 14-day incubation period of the coronavirus plus the time taken to confirm a positive test result. It automatically deletes contacts older than 21 days. Nobody can access the encrypted information on the phone, including the user. If a person tests positive for COVID-19, a state or territory health official will ask for their consent to upload their digital handshake information to the national COVID-safe data store. As much as it sounds all good, these apps have a limited adoption around the world because of reservation on data privacy. Countries like Israel and Pakistan have outrightly acknowledged their surveillance adoption in their COVID-19 tracing. Apps. Such apps use hard-coded credentials which they send in securely to communicate to the government server and download the exact coordinates of infected people in order to provide a map of their locations. These apps have also used an encrypted database that can be accessed with either attackers with physical access to the device or malicious apps with root access. As technology continues to curb the spread of COVID-19 across the world, it is important for you to know that you have a right to privacy and particular participate in the process with the required knowledge. And that has been the tech of the week. I think the tech service have had a time of their life using technology to develop apps that have been used to solve world problems. 
And now to the interview segment, we have something special just for you. Grace Githaiga is not around, but I'm sure she wouldn't mind a shout out from you on her Twitter at Grace Githaiga. This story will definitely interest you. Here it goes. The Ministry of Health would like to inform the general public that Uganda has confirmed her first case of coronavirus disease, COVID-19. The Uganda government immediately enacted stringent measures to curb the spread of the virus, from shutting down all of the country's border points to enacting a 24-hour curfew. And by amending the Public Health Act, Government and Ministry of Health expanded the search powers of health workers, allowing them to make arbitrary visits to any premises suspected of having COVID-19 patients. Government looks at the majority, protecting the bigger picture, the majority, the many, so that we have uh, some lives uh, tomorrow. And in that, some of the measures may, to some extent, hinder or infringe on your freedoms. At the beginning, they would come and, and do tests every two weeks the ministry. Like the very first time, we had a few people who were positive, and that time it was the time the stigma was very high. They would collect you from your home. Well, like the whole village now doesn't want to talk to me, because they saw me being taken in an ambulance. State actors and private entities have collected, processed, and shared personal data, including sensitive health data, in breach of the data protection principles and safeguards in the national data protection laws. Yes, information was created, was, was collected, even when it was necessary. Challenge is, there, there are no regulations to, to, to regulate the use of the data and collection of the data. We don't have um, um, enough data protection for the end user. This is partly because the health workers involved in, in, in this COVID intervention do not have enough awareness on, on, on data protection. So in this situation, uh, health workers have been moving around trying to trace COVID contacts, but also they've been collecting information which has been personal and intrusive in nature. Take the example of Apostle Julius, whose unconscious mother had her COVID swab taken without anyone's consent. Uh, Tuesday. On Friday, on Friday morning, neba netufune simunge vamo minister of Ereth. Because it is me who took the patient in Zambia. It, the patient was under my supervision. Kati, ne watu gamba anti ya fa COVID. Watu gamba anti ya fa COVID. Ne mbabuza, muamu jako sampo yona. Ela ganti ya fude COVID. Ne, ne bangamba, sampo bajite kingi la mu intensive care. Ne mbagaba, that is wrong. Omurado yali wange. You cannot do any test without my consent. This unsupervised collection of data during the first year of the pandemic revealed gaps in the enforcement of data protection laws in Uganda. Won't be shocked a few days from now if you go to buy a Rolex and you find it wrapped in a COVID results slip of someone because someone has found their HIV results before. It's one thing to lobby for more laws, but even the, the few laws we have, we don't implement them or enforce them. For the case of Uganda, NITA, is the custodian, it's the custodian of data protection. And under the, the legal framework, they are mandated to manage any conflicts or handle any incidents of data breaches. Like in most countries, Uganda used contact tracing applications to curb the spread of the pandemic, even though the Ministry of Health itself denies having actively used these applications. We have really deployed a number of, of applications, but uh, for contact tracing, we have rather uh, not developed so fast in that area. There are some digital technologies they use uh, to, to verify whether your COVID tests are in, uh, are in order, whether you're negative or positive, and they keep track of these people who are entering inside and outside the country. Most people were asking questions, what happens with the user information that they're collecting? Is it personal in nature? Is it generic in nature? What are the safeguards? Who gets to keep this information? And how, how do I give my consent? What are, 
what are the qualifications for this consent. So these are some of the key issues. In 2010, Uganda enacted into law the Regulation of Interception of Communications Act. Now that legitimately gives government the powers to snoop on you. As expected, the most immediate victim of this act was the individual's freedom of expression. I made a video on Facebook. There is no privacy. If I don't stop talking, I'm going to With the directives of UCC, yeah, for all the other communicators to, 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 to register with them, those infringe them more on the freedom of expression. Those directives were passed last year in October 7th, and they required whoever has big numbers on social media, you go and register with them before you do anything else. So if they have interest, on you, interest with you, they can easily come for you and block you and do all those funny things. So what becomes of the people whose freedoms had been infringed upon? What available recourse do citizens have as they wait for the data protection laws to catch up? In case you suffer, rather a data breach as a, as a, as a person, you can report that breach one to the regulatory authority. Uh, government should speed up on the regulations. It's a new phenomenon. Everyone is still struggling to understand what their rights are, what their obligations are. For the data subjects or citizens, do you know who has your data? Are you aware of the technology you're using? Do the health officials act in public interest? And, and intervene and try to curb the spread of the pandemic, but also at the same time, do they have the capability to protect the user's data? Or if they breach the user's data, what are the implications? Who holds them accountable? Nisa sita ya usiku, nikapata namba ya kigeni. Kushika simu, wakanambia sisi ni watu wa COVID. Tumesukudia kuchukua sample. Nikauliza kuchukua sample wapi sahi tena usiku. Nika fungua mlango, nikaenda kwa balcon. Nikapata inje, watu wamejia chini. Eh, mi nika igiza uoga, nika sama sizi kutoka inje. Nika wafate, nika rudi ndani, nika ka. Waka watu wanapiga simu, anaendelea kupiga simu. Na wambia nilikuambia sizi kutoka inje sai. Mbono mbado na shindilia kunisumbua. Ati wewe lazima utoke inje. Lazima tuchukue samples. Nika wambia kama ni sample joe subui. Mtachukua sample, mtanipata. Kenya confirmed its first coronavirus case on 13th March the year 2020. The emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic caught most of the world's government off guard. Addressing the pandemic has required effective responses by the government, private sectors and the international community in general, including tracking the infection rates and preventing the spread of the disease. A pandemic means um, an awareness. Um, a pandemic means um, confusion. So you find um, there was laxity by the government agencies to, to tell us, to give patient information because they were more concerned about preventative, you know, telling us do this, do this. But talking to us about where my information is going, was, there was laxity with that. And uh, I hope that will change now that there is a, let me not call it a flattened curve, but we seem to be aware of what we are doing right now. Yeah. Just like the rest of the world, Kenya turned to technology to help curb the virus. Several contact tracing apps were created, amongst them being Jitenge, which means self-isolate in Swahili, which was developed by M Kenya and jointly developed with the Ministry of Health. This application was meant to assist Kenya health officials to trace contacts. The aim of this contract tracing applications, as described by the developers, was that um, they will provide an easy mechanism to trace individuals who perhaps have tested positive or people who've interacted with people who've tested positive. So there are different kinds of technology used and the most common was Bluetooth technology. 
um, on that app store that um, they created an app that if you come across or interact with somebody who's tested positive you'll get a message say hey by the way you came you, you interacted with somebody who tested positive you also need to uh, to get tested the apps have also been used to monitor people who've either traveled or have tested positive in some countries to ensure that somebody is self-isolating. Um, for example, somebody is quarantined and they're not going against those uh, quarantine guidelines because the app using the mobile phone technology, if you go outside a certain area, then the app notifies um, the authority. If you have symptoms that escalate, you'll put uh, that information in that app and that will allow for, uh, for immediate action uh, by the authorities. As part of the pandemic surveillance, an individual is to provide extensive personal information. You need to give your ID number, you need to give your location, your phone number. We don't know, but we're just doing it, we're gullible. We give our information. Nobody ever thinks, even as I sit here and I tell you, I have no idea what it is they did with whether it was my x-rays, because I sent everything. As a patient, you have a right to know where the information collected about you goes and what the information is used to do and how the information is disseminated through various agencies. Work of sensitizing the public and also protecting the public is the work of the data commissioner who is in charge of enforcing laws on data protection of ensuring that data handlers, which includes uh, government, which includes app developers, that those data handlers abide by principles of data protection. We also require very clear guidelines from the Office of the Data Commissioner on collection, analysis, storage, and transfer of sensitive data, health data. This has been done by data protection authorities around the world where they say, of, of course, they tell their government, we agree that this is going to be used for a public purpose, for public health purpose. But as you are doing that, please comply with these basic data protection principles. The Ministry of um, ICT should come out strongly and talk to us about data. I mean, the PS, the CS should be at the front line in protecting our data. It's only when we push back, and it's just that one little effort saying, why is it that you need buying all this information? Why? You know that why could change a lot of things. I hope you've taken something from that, like it's your right to know who has your data and where your data is going. Aside from that, let me take you to the Innovators Club, where we show you how to create a data privacy policy for your website to keep your data secured. Check this out. A privacy policy tells users what you're doing with their data. Anything you gather from them, whether it be an email address, first name, location, or whatever, it has to be disclosed to your website visitor, and then you have to tell them what you plan to do with that information, even if your plans are as simple as sending a birthday discount via email. So you might be wondering, what should your privacy policy include? Well, here's a few things. How you collect information, what you do with collected information, what cookies, pixels, and other trackers your site uses and their purpose, any advertising networks and their methods or purpose of data collection and ad delivery, how your users can opt in and opt out of their data being collected and stored, how your users can request their data be turned over to them and or deleted, and finally, contact information for site administrators. These things are the bread and butter of privacy policies. Ideally, visitors would take a look at your policy and decide if they're comfortable with using your services. More realistically, it covers you legally. So what do you do with user data? Here's a real kicker. What you do with the data is just as important to disclose as it is that you are actually collecting it. You might be wondering why, and it's because data is big business. Many sites sell or share their user data. Others, more ethically, use the collected data to personalize content and ads or other similar applications. 
Regardless of what the use is, you must disclose it. In any case, if someone's not comfortable with the way a website uses their information, the GDPR outlines the right to be forgotten. This means sites are bound by law to delete your information if you ask them to. So finally, how do you actually create a privacy policy? Ideally, you'd enlist the help of a lawyer to help you draft your privacy policy. However, that's not a practical option or really necessary for the vast majority of site owners. We're going to touch on a few websites that can generate a simple privacy policy for you. Number one, Termageddon. Anytime new laws are passed that affect privacy data, Termageddon updates your embedded privacy policy to reflect them. Setting it up as as simple as answering questions about your business or website. Then you paste an embed code into the page where it will live. You can override any updates or changes and you can edit the policy manually too. If you handle a lot of user data, then this is $10 a month well spent. Number two, terms feed. Each time you want to create a new policy, the service will walk you through a questionnaire to help you determine the clauses you need. When the process is over, you'll receive your new policy via email. The turnaround is pretty quick, and that way you can paste it into your website and have it live for your visitors immediately. It's free with paid options available. And finally, number three, Firebase. Powered by Google and designed mostly for mobile apps, Firebase is a great privacy generator, especially when you want something fast, easy, and customized for very specific services. It's easy to implement and set up, and it's a more simplistic privacy policy. However, that doesn't mean it's useless or even bad. The best part, though, is that it's free. And finally, how do you actually add your privacy policy to your website? Well, think about it. A privacy policy is simply a page. So if you're using WordPress, create a new page, paste your policy, and then publish it. Now just add a link to your navigation location of your choice, and you're all set and ready to go. We have finally come to the fun segment where we ask you the question, did you know? Welcome to the digital age. In today's connected world, we're living much of our lives online. As a result, companies everywhere are creating large storehouses of data on all of us. The most obvious information being collected is social media data. Everything you post publicly, and in some cases, privately, is being stored and analyzed. But it's not just social media. There is now a digital record of everything you buy, everything you watch, where you go and what happens at your house. Even your physical characteristics are tracked and stored. All of this data is being used to create profiles of us. Using unique algorithms, they are able to cater marketing strategies directly to you. Some groups are even profiling your personality to specially adapt their interaction with you. The aggregation and storage of this data is becoming one of the most profitable enterprises on the planet. Everything you post, tweet about, like, and more is being collected. Even the location from where you post can be gathered and can be tracked in real time, putting you at risk. Even after social media accounts are deleted, personal information can still be collected through a variety of means. After all is said and done, it's important to know what is being done with your data and to make informed decisions on what you post. You don't have to stop tweeting. You don't have to abandon social media. Just ask yourself these questions before you post. Am I okay with this existing forever? Am I okay with this being read by anyone? Am I okay with this being used to profile who I am? If so, post away. Enjoy social media responsibly. That brings us to the end of today's show. And you know the drill, the conversation never stops. So let me sample a few of the comments we got on social media from the last show. Jen Wamboy says she liked Android 12 and can't wait to have it on her phone. 
Brand Miner says he enjoyed the show and Lucy W says she's interested in, her in enrolling her child to STEM Cafe to learn about robotics. You can get us across all social media platforms at KBC Channel 1. And today we have had the question where we ask you, how do you feel about the authorities and other information sharing platforms accessing your data and private information Without your consent, the hashtag is Tech on Tech. We'd like to hear from you. I've been your host, Stephanie Ayeta, and you can get me across all social media platforms at Stephanie Ayeta. Let's keep it tech, and until next week, adios.